Order, please. We'll call the uh, committee on public accounts to order. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind everybody in the audience, if you would turn your phones to silent or vibrate, please. So we'll begin with introductions and we'll start uh, with the committee members introducing themselves. I'm gonna ask if we go down the front line and then start at the back line and come back up. So we'll begin with you, Ms. Roberts. Good morning, Lisa Roberts. Uh, nice to be with you. Good morning, Tim Hallman, MLA for Dartmouth East. Good morning, Suzanne Lonis Croft, MLA Lunenburg and Vice Chair. Hi, I'm Margaret Miller, MLA for Hans East. Benjamin Jessam, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Good morning, all. Uh, Rafa Di Costanzo, I'm the MLA for Clayton Park West, and welcome. Good morning and welcome here to this morning, uh, Bill Horn, MLA for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Good morning, I'm Susan LeBlanc, the MLA for Dartmouth North. Okay, thank you. And behind them we have the members of the caucus staff that are uh, with us again. And we have uh, representatives of the clerk's office, the auditor general's office, uh, Ledge Council, and Ledge TV. So uh, just a couple of reminders before we start. You're asked to please keep your mask on 
during the meeting unless you're speaking. Uh, I'm, in order to facilitate the back and forth, I'm not going to be wearing my mask, but I think we have enough distancing at this point. So we're asking also that in an effort to limit movement within the chamber, for you to stay in your seat as much as possible. So in order to accommodate all this, uh, we'll take a short break after put the one hour mark of the meeting. And to do that, we have to ask for an agreement from the committee to extend the length of the meeting by 15 minutes. Is this agreed? Thank you. So when we, when you leave the chamber, you'll go out the side exit. And if you come back in, you come back in through the main doors. So I think that looks after all the preamble that's taken place before this morning's meeting. So on today's agenda, we have officials from the Nova Scotia Health Authority to discuss cybersecurity and fraud risks from the October 19th financial report of the Auditor General. So to begin, we'll ask the witnesses to introduce themselves, please. <coughs> Good morning, I'm Brendan Carr. Good morning, Derek Spinney. Andrew Nemirovsky. Karen Hornberger. Thank you, and uh, we'll ask the witnesses to make their opening remarks, Dr. Kerr. Thank you very much, and good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to meet with you today. So my name is Dr. Brendan Carr, and I have the privilege to serve as the President and Chief Executive Officer of Nova Scotia Health. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today with my colleagues, uh, Mr. Derek Spinney, our Vice President of Corporate Services Infrastructure and our Chief Financial Officer, with Mr. Andrew Nimnovsky, our Senior Director of Information Management, Information Technology and Chief Information Officer, and Karen Hornberger, our Provincial Director of Privacy. Uh, as you know, we are originally slated to be uh, before you uh, back in April, um, but as we're all aware, COVID uh, changed many of our plans, uh, and we're, uh, we are pleased to be here uh, with you today. Uh, we welcome this opportunity to discuss uh, questions about cybersecurity and fraud risks, uh, as reported in the October 2019 report of the Auditor General. Uh, we do accept the findings from that report, and we're committed to continuing our efforts uh, to address any outstanding issues. I'd like to first provide a bit of context around our organization. Um, we are the largest health organization in Atlantic Canada and indeed the largest employer in Nova Scotia. We serve a population of about 971,000 Nova Scotians and provide some services to other residents in Atlantic Canada. Uh, within our $2.3 billion budget, we're responsible for hospital and community-based services, including mental health and addictions, public health and primary health care. Our settings range from the highly specialized QE2 in Halifax uh, to nine regional hospitals and more than 30 community hospitals and health centers. Uh, within the organization, there are about uh, 24,700 employees, uh, 6,500 volunteers, uh, over 5,500 learners of various uh, descriptions working with us, uh, 2,900 physicians and medical residents, 160 contracted continuing care service providers, 37 community health boards, and 41 hospital foundations, and 33 auxiliaries. So overall, there are probably in excess of 40,000 people working within our health system uh, who are um, both part of our system, members of our communities, and as it pertains to today's discussion, interacting with information uh, within the health system. So as you, can, as you can see, we operate a large, complex organization with many important stakeholders. And we are committed to being accountable to you and to every Nova Scotian. And there's been significant progress following the creation of One Health Authority, and we know that work uh, is ongoing. The October 2019 Auditor General's report contained two themes of concern relating to Nova Scotia Health. Uh, the first dealt with the office's, the, uh, that office's assessment of the status of our internal controls. Uh, and the potential for fraud or error, and our continued progress against uh, strengthening these controls. And so, as a non-accountant, I understand internal controls to really be systems, rules, and processes put in place to ensure the integrity of our financial information and to pre prevent fraud or loss. And they include things like how we control access to our systems, uh, how we reconcile accounts, uh, how we conduct physical audits of particular uh, materials, uh, and what sort of specific approval processes we have in place to ensure that we're using the right resources for the right thing. 
There are literally hundreds of such controls in any large accounting system, and we always balance the cost of establishing the control uh, and maintaining that control with the inherent risk associated with the item being protected by that control. So maybe to, 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 to explain that in, in, uh, in, a, <laughs> in a way that I can understand, um, we, uh, if, we were, if we were to think about the risk of theft of losing track with a, a large piece of equipment like a CT scanner or an anesthesia machine that would be by its nature quite conspicuous, um, there would be inherently a, quite a minimal risk that we would lose track of one of those kinds of items. Whereas uh, if we were looking at uh, a large quantity of cash, uh, we would, we would in inherently be very concerned with having specific controls around that. If we were thinking about a small amount of petty cash, let's say less than $100, we would, have to, we would balance the energy or the effort required to put controls in place around that very small, insignificant, relatively amount of money compared to a, 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 a large ledger with, uh, you know, with millions of dollars of receivables or some other significant assets within our system. So, so we must always balance, um, uh, and we typically ask ourselves, what's the real potential for loss? Uh, and what makes sense in terms of the uh, control processes that we should be putting in place around those specific assets. Uh, and I would say as stewards of the public resources, we are constantly mindful of this and we constantly, we're constantly working to develop and understand our control environment better. Uh, and this is something that is uh, of great importance to our senior leadership team and to our board as well. Um, strong internal controls are of the utmost importance to us, which is why several comprehensive strategies have been implemented uh, and are underway to strengthen our and support our financial control environment. Uh, in Mr. Pickup's report, we are pleased to see his first key message where he stated, Nova Scotians can rely on government's financial information, including that of the Nova Scotia Health Authority. And that says really a great deal. Uh, do we have gaps? Absolutely. Uh, and we have every confidence that we will address the points identified in the auditor's report as we continue to move forward. Uh, will we always have some gaps, uh, given the size and complexity of our organization? Probably. Um, and so we, this is an area that we understand we will, we will continuously be working on to try to improve our control environment in the context of our, our, our changing organization. We appreciate the con that the concept of significant control weaknesses, uh, as they're described in the report, uh, may be a cause for concern. And as a point of clarification, as an, or an organization can have significant control weaknesses, but still have an unmodified or clean audit opinion, uh, meaning its financial statements are fairly presented and accurately represent the organization. And that's exactly the case with Nova Scotia Health and our financial statements to March 31st, 2019, and also to March 31st, 2020. Uh, we are also reassured by the fact that neither the Office of the Auditor General nor our own internal audit team have identified any inappropriate activity or expenses uh, and that the weaknesses that have been identified have not really resulted in any significant impact to the organization or our financial statements. We believe this is a recognition of the success uh, and, uh, of our successes in meeting our obligations to protect the funding allocated to us to provide quality health care to Nova Scotians. Now, the second theme of the report dealt with cybersecurity and Nova Scotia's health responsibility in recognizing and mitigating risks, particularly in light of the increasing fre frequency and sophistication of cyber attacks. And we certainly agree that cybersecurity is of paramount concern as a society and as an organization, and as, particularly as we move forward with new technologies uh, like electronic health records. And unlike the internal control environment, um, which we've talked about, um, which is fairly well understood and I think, uh, yeah, well, uh, is, is uh, practiced well, cybersecurity is not quite as clear. It's something that is emerging uh, and it continues to grow and evolve. So as such, several years ago, a decision was made jointly to manage the technology environment across government, including Nova Scotia Health, through Nova Scotia Digital Services. And a shared service model has benefits as we have confidence in our governance partner to make the necessary investments to ensure the security of our technology assets. And so we continuously work in partnership uh, with NSDS uh, to ensure this in, uh, to, to, con to controls and security. So the privacy and security of the personal information of our employees, physicians, and those we serve is a top priority for Nova Scotia Health. And the Auditor General's report suggests that while the enterprise concepts are Nova Scotia digital service responsibilities, our specific clinical applications are ours and can be at risk. And we agree with that and that we have a responsibility and that our efforts to educate our employees, our physicians, and learners on cybersecurity best practices 
and to have policies and procedures in place that govern our use of technology are a critical component of protection. We've been making progress in this field and we're pleased to speak about this to you today. Mr. Nemirovsky will deal with your specific questions uh, in this area. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that a substantive part of addressing the issue raised by Mr. Pickup relates to our ongoing work of bringing together diverse processes and systems from nine previous district health authorities. We marked five years as an organization on April the 1st of this year, and we are justifiably proud of the significant progress that has been made. Uh, there is more work to do, and we will continue our efforts to develop and implement the most efficient and appropriate processes across all of our programs and services. And so, uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I will thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today. We will, we will look forward to our discussion. We recognize that there may be questions that we can't answer uh, here on the spot, and so we commit to providing you and your committee uh, the answers as quickly as we can, and certainly within the next couple of days. Uh, we look, look forward to offering assurances that we remain accountable for the valuable financial uh, resources and entrusted to us as part of our mandate to govern, manage, and deliver quality health services to the people of Nova Scotia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carr, and we'll go now to the first round of questioning, 20 minutes per caucus, beginning with the PC caucus, Mr. Halbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Dr. Carr, thank you very much for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you to all the staff at Nova Scotia Health Authority for their uh, ongoing work uh, to, uh, to uh, protect Nova Scotians, especially during, uh, the co in the COVID-19 era. Uh, you've certainly clearly outlined that this is a massive organization with enormous responsibilities, and uh, I think Nova Scotians certainly understand that. Uh, you know, with 40,000 uh, working within our, our health system, there's certainly a lot of moving parts. Uh, however, uh, certainly COVID's taught us uh, how critical it is to adapt and pivot to, to changing circumstances. Uh, when it comes to fraud risk, when it comes to cyber security, uh, I think you said it really well, uh, Dr. Carr, that uh, privacy is paramount. It is paramount uh, to Nova Scotians and Canadians. Uh, so that being said, uh, with, respect to, with respect to the status of the internal controls, uh, which uh, you've indicated, Dr. Carr, your understanding is that this relates to the systems and rules and various processes that are in place uh, to ensure safety. Um, you indicated that there, uh, there are gaps. So could, could you or staff be specific? What are those two or three perennial gaps and what steps are being taken to address those gaps as it relates to, as it relates to internal controls? Dr. Carr. Pass that question on to my colleague, Mr. Spinney, to respond. Mr. Spinney. Thank you. So first of all, thank you for having, <coughs> having us here today. It is truly our, our privilege. So it's a great question. And with all of those moving parts, how do you, how do you focus? How, how do you even tackle such a thing? And so we can look to some guidance that's actually provided, some industry standards. And so in particular, we look at the COSO framework. So there's a framework that says that there's really five domains that you can pay attention to that can kind of structure your conversation as you go through it. And so the first one is your environment. And an easy way to explain that is what's, what's the tone at the top? How are things being set in that organization? Kind of to one extreme, is it, is it a cowboy organization, if I can use that analogy? Uh, or is it an organization that has the appropriate policies, procedures, and framework in place to take internal controls very seriously. And of course, we're here today to talk about us being on the far right of that. And so as an example, some of the things that we have is a code of misconduct. So every time an employee joins the organization, they have to read and sign the code of conduct. And that's reviewed every year. Another key part for us that sets this tone at the top is the policy around our board, our, our board of directors. So our board of directors is also tasked with governance. And so they are an independent uh, body that sits and meets with us on a regular basis that they have the stewardship and the governance of the financial results as well. So those are just two examples of the uh, environments that you're setting at the top. The next one is around assessing the risks. And so when you assess a risk, as Dr. Carr mentioned in his opening comments, you really start to take into a few things, the likelihood and the impact. So step one is what's the threat? So if you were dealing with cash, for instance, um, you know, the, the risk is that the cash would disappear. So in our business office, for instance, if somebody paid something and gave us cash, there's a risk that that cash would end up disappearing. 
So then the next thing that we do is we assess that. And the way that we assess that is what's the likelihood that that cash could go missing? And in this example, we'll say that it was high. And then what's the impact? And let's, in this case, we'll say it's maybe medium because it's smaller amounts of cash. So when we take those two things together, we conclude we need a control to put on top of that. So there's an inherent risk. We put controls on top, and then we reevaluate it to say, okay, what does that risk look like now? What's the residual risk, if you will, after those controls have been put into place? The next part is around communication. So we need to make sure that our staff uh, and volunteers and everybody that actually touches us, uh, including researchers, in, in fact, uh, that they understand what controls we have in place and what their role is in that. And then the last one is around monitoring. So it's one thing to have a control. It's another thing to make sure that you're actually monitoring it to make sure that it's actually taking place. And so two of the things that were identified uh, in our last audit with the Auditor General was around time reporting. And so, as you can appreciate, with 22,000 people on our payroll, again, very large organization, as you pointed out, there, there's uh, an inherent risk that something could go wrong in that process. So we had an external risk assessment done on our payroll, and our payroll is about 70% of our total expenses. And that assessment ident identified 21 inherent risks. After going through all of those they, we, and applying controls and so on, we were left with two that we said, they still have residual risk that we need to deal with. And the two in particular were the um, possibility that people could um, book overtime, and not work overtime. So the, the theft of time, if you will. Uh, so you could be paid for an overtime shift that you didn't work, perhaps. And the second one was around sick time. It was conceivable that people are taking sick time, but not, not necessarily uh, being sick, if I, if I can say it that way. And so what we've done to mitigate those risks is we, ha we have five different time systems uh, across Nova Scotia. Again, that residual effect of bringing together nine health authorities. So we've brought those five systems together so that we can have one place that we can actually see all of that activity. And we can see who's approving their time, because it is required that you approve, that your time gets approved. Uh, all, all the way up to Dr. Carr, in fact. <laughs> Our board chair actually approves Dr. Carr's time. And so in that process, we were able to report that our compliance rate was 61% in this previous past year. Uh, and 2018 was the calendar year of that. And so what we've done is we've brought that system together to make it more easy, and we actually report that on a monthly basis now, uh, particularly on my team. My team is about 3,500 of the 20,000. And seeing what we can do to increase that compliance rate, and we're already above 70%, and uh, not to preclude what the AG's office will say this year, but we think we've done a, a pretty good job, and, and we'll see what this year's audit uh, concludes around that. The other things that we do is we have a uh, budget variance report that goes out to all cost center uh, managers. So a cost center is kind of like it sounds. It's, you know, it's, it's a center that has costs in it that you're responsible for. So our team, the finance team, issues a report to you that identifies any uh, supplier compensation that was missing your budget by either $50,000 or 10% variance. So even if you've got a smaller budget, a 10% variance would flag you. And the system requires you to put in a comment to address that, what, what was the issue. And until COVID times, we were running at 90%. So 90% of managers that had these variances were actually uh, re responding that way. And then in addition to that, what we've done, and we've walked through the AG's office some of these numbers, is identified of the people who are not reporting, not complying to the uh, signing off of the time, how much overtime is actually exposed there. So if it's Dr. Carr, for instance, to pick on him today, if, if he didn't get his time approved, you know, what is the actual uh, inherent risk there? It looks a lot different than somebody who works a lot overtime, right? So we're going through there to, to understand, even of those who didn't approve, what is the residual risk still left over there? Um, so we're pleased with our progress on that. We think we'll have more progress to go through with, uh, uh, with Michael McPhee and team that I keep looking down at uh, this year as we go through it. And then on the sick time, what we do there is there's a bit of an industry standard of around 4% for your sick time. So anytime something comes up greater than 4%, it gets flagged through HR with the manager to say, you know, this situation is greater than 4%. 
4%, and then they look at it uh, on an individual basis. But uh, you know, just given the subject matter, matter there, we, we are okay with providing more latitude there. So again, just because there's a risk doesn't mean that you need to go to an extreme on it. So we do look at it um, case by case as the sick time things come up to make sure that it's okay. So those are the two examples that I would say, the time reporting uh, and within the time reporting, um, the overtime and the sick time. Mr. Hum. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for that response. I appreciate you taking the time going over the components of that framework. Um, you know, certainly we all know in point of fact by October of 2019, um, when the financial report comes out from the Auditor General, that, that there is clearly, um, you know, the cybersecurity risk management program continues to evolve. That's the conclusion. Um, we know even before 2019, uh, risk management, cybersecurity is, is paramount as a priority to Nova Scotians. So you've outlined, you know, sort of what, what components need to fall into place to ensure we're prioritizing this, whether it's the culture at the top, tone at the top. I'd like you to provide us a history lesson. What, what were the factors that led to this financial report uh, concluding that there, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and perhaps, you know, what is being done differently now? Uh, so if you could provide us that history lesson, I think that's critical. Mr. Spinney. Sorry, thank you. Uh, so that would be great. So uh, in the case of our internal controls, and maybe I'll take two steps at that, both the cybersecurity piece, uh, which has a shorter history, and then internal controls, which has the longer history. So in the case of internal controls, you know, we became an organization in 2015. And so again, we brought together the nine health authorities, trying to figure out how can we do this from a people process technology point of view to create the value that was envisioned at the time that that took place. And in doing so, all of those existing controls, as you can appreciate, started to, to collide into one group. And so we used the framework that we've been through to say, okay, how can we actually structure this? And the whole process is a, is a journey. And so it's, it's, although some parts can go in parallel, you can also think of it as a chronological journey. In that the first thing is that you kind of st start with your control environment. And then from there you say, okay, well, what are the different um, risks in the organization? What controls am I going to put in place? How can I communicate this? And then how do I monitor it? And so the communication and the monitoring, those two things in particular are kind of at the tail end of that process. Until you actually have something, you've identified your risks, you've evaluated what was inherent, what is residual after you've put the controls in, you're not sure what to communicate and you're certainly not sure what to monitor. And so, uh, not to speak for the AG's office, but part of what they've concluded is that our internal control environment is incomplete. And by incomplete, I would expand that to say, in particular, on the tail end of that chronological process, in that we have gone through the first three, um, and in my words, not theirs, I think that we did that quite well. And in the last two, those are the areas that we're really working on. So we've done a couple things with that. One of them is, again, we engaged outside assistance to look at our current state, look at where we need to be and then to give us that roadmap and what are the very specific steps. So one of the things that we want to make sure and we've got a, a register of the steps is what are the specific steps that we're going to take in order to get to that uh, end piece. Around the information and the communication, for instance, uh, a very tangible example uh, that we're using and related to fraud, which is today's topic, is the fact that um, the AG pointed out in the report that mandatory fraud training was not taking place everywhere. And we were one of those organizations. And so by the end of 2020, so by the end of December 2020, in the last couple months here, uh, we will have in our uh, LMS, our learning uh, management system, uh, mandatory fraud training. That, that is now the material has all uh, been put together. We've been through it. We're just waiting to launch the site, if you will. Uh, so there, there will be that mandatory uh, training. Another thing that we're doing, even with our finance and audit committee, is in November there will be a half-day session where, we're, again, we're bringing in outside help to help educate even our own board members, our finance and audit committee members, what is a good internal control environment? What's the benchmark? So they're tasked with governance to make sure that we achieve that. So we want to make sure that they understand what does that benchmark look like 
and then understand where we are. So again, that they can get very specific and understand the AG's observations to say, well, where do we have uh, yet to go on that? And then around the monitoring aspect, what we're doing is uh, documenting and, and having uh, evidence recorded. So in our ERP system, so we use SAP as our ERP system, there's a governance risk and compliance uh, module and it allows you to store documentation and these sorts of things. So that when the AG is auditing us and they say, how do we have proof, if you will, that you did monitor that, that the documentation is actually uh, available. So those, that's kind of a bit of the history lesson on the internal controls. On the cybersecurity, as Dr. Carr pointed out, it's been uh, more recent, uh, I guess I could phrase it that way, uh, the different risks that are coming forward and who's actually responsible for it. So in 2016, the province would have initiated and hired a CIO, and part of their role was to set up a cyber risk program. And so they did that. Uh, two years before that was the shared services uh, legislation in 2014, and it was envisioned in there that further clarity would be given uh, to the government entities on who was responsible for what and who would get what service from whom. So in 2014, shared services, 2016, the CIO came in, uh, and then between 16 and now, people have really been trying to uh, create those delineations, if I could say it that way. And what we've done in particular is we've uh, engaged another outside firm that their report is um, almost final. I've been through it with Andrew and it's final by the end of this month, so we'll go through it with our finance and audit committee that again outlines um, what in particular our policy should say, because as Dr. Carr pointed out, we agreed with the Auditor General's statement that we are responsible for our clinical applications and its data. So what is our policy and what is the framework that we're going to put around that? And the National Standards um, Institute and Technology uh, actually has a framework that I won't go into around that as well, uh, but suffice it to say that there is some guidance that we're, what we're provided there is an industry standard. And the outside uh, consultant has gone through that and really uh, helped us focus on uh, what specifically should be our role, what is the necessary governance structure, and then also, um, again, a bit of a roadmap to get from where we are today to where we need to be. So although we do share services uh, from NSDS, um, there are some things that are more specifically ours than theirs. So strategy, governance, compliance, those first three things uh, are really coming out uh, to, to say that's really what is, is more owned with us. But the performance management and the operations of that, it is recognized that we have a heavier reliance on NSDS because sometimes they're the experts in some of these particular things that we rely on. But that needs to be documented and agreed upon and written down. So that's kind of the journey that we've taken on the cybersecurity. Thank you, Mr. Hobbin. With about three minutes left in your... I appreciate that. Uh, with respect to... Um you know, examples where we're hearing uh, through the media um, about uh, cybersecurity breaches. Uh, I have three articles in front of me here from the CBC, two from Jack Julian, one from Yvonne Colbert. One from Yvonne Colbert outlines, uh, Nova Scotia government acknowledges system failed to protect privacy of 10,000 people, and that's related to workers' compensation. The other two are related to healthcare privacy breaches. And uh, one of the individuals who had a privacy breach said the following, quote, I wanted to speak out just to let people know that this is something that is happening. There were almost 60 people involved in this particular breach, and I don't see any changes being made. There's no internal policies that have changed or procedures that may protect somebody else in this situation, end quote. So what would you say to this individual? Why does there seem to be a discrepancy between what you've outlined in terms of the improvements NSHA is making and in terms of what we're hearing from, from Nova Scotians? Mr. Spinney. Thank you, and I'm going to get Mr. Nemirovsky to help me with kind of the, the particulars of the example that he may wish to go through. Um, I think some of that, just to intro that, is, is really around progress. And so it's points in time as we go through it. Uh, 
we, we, we can't be good enough is really kind of our mantra. Uh, and so we recognize that we have work to do, absolutely. And I, I don't know that we'll ever get there, if you will. I don't know that you can get there uh, because it is so important uh, to us and to Nova Scotians. Um, but there certainly uh, is progress uh, that is underway uh, and improvements. And so as you indicate, there are certainly examples uh, where we've... Um, we as a province, I'll, I'll call it that way, uh, is certainly susceptible and some things have happened. Um, but there's also literally thousands of examples that, that don't make uh, the news, if you will, uh, that, that, that take place every day uh, that are adequately defended against, uh, for instance. And so, Andrew? Mr. Nebraska. Thank you. So, uh, to dig into that one a little bit, the, the, the staff who are uh, essentially breaching uh, patient information. A lot of that actually isn't related to cybersecurity per se. It's more uh, a control piece around access, auditing, uh, and that's actually where uh, Mrs. Hornberger's team comes in uh, because the privacy office actually looks after a lot of that um, policy work. Uh, I'll, I'll let her speak to the updates because there have been a few, but uh, it's really not a cybersecurity threat because we look at cybersecurity more as an external threat coming in uh, as opposed to an internal where it's a staff member accessing stuff inappropriately. Uh, but Karen? Ms. Hornberger, can you uh, try and get it in about 20 seconds? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Um, so some of the audits with those articles by Mr. Julian the breaches that happened this summer were found as a result of improved auditing. Um, that, and I can't speak to specific cases. I'm familiar with both the cases that were reported on this summer and the case that that um, person in the article is quoting, but I'm unable to speak to the specifics because of privacy reasons. And so some of the improvements we've made in our auditing led us to discover the breaches that were reported this summer where there were some 211 people notified because we did improve our auditing process. Thank you. The time for the PC caucus for the first round is up. We'll move now to the NDP caucus. Ms. Roberts. Thank you, and, and thank you all very much for your work and for being here. Um, I have about 20 minutes, and right now the answers are running about eight minutes, and I'd like to get through a few more questions. So I'm going to try to ask a couple quick snappers. Um, one is, has the NSHA implemented a fraud risk hotline? Mr. Spinney. Thank you. Uh, the short answer is yes, but if I can elaborate just a little bit. In, in, in March of this year, Dr. Carr actually announced the organization our latest whistleblower policy, so there is a policy. Uh, and that really brought together existing policies, but again, into that one new Nova Scotia Health one. Uh, there are two aspects of that uh, whistleblower. There, there's um, an email address that people can use, uh, and there's also a 1-800 number. So yes, it is implemented and up and running. Ms. Roberts? Thank you very much. It, that's good to hear. Um, and I guess I'd invite either uh, Mr. Car uh, Dr. Carr, Mr. Carr, Mr. Carr, um, to... Uh, to comment or, or someone else as, as you see fit. But it, it strikes me that in such a large organization with such a large budget, um, you know, the, the, the risk is not just of, of fraud with cash or time, but also effort. Um, exp like, how are we ensuring that the effort that we collectively as Nova Scotians are, are paying for is actually serving the best health outcomes for Nova Scotia. So is, is there a way in which that is, um, I guess, information about that and observations about that um, actually can get from the front lines, um, you know, from administrative staff um, up to the leadership in a way that helps to shape the organization? Dr. Kerr question and yeah while we might not uh, consider that uh, let's call it waste or inefficiency as fraud but in but uh, uh, and practically though in, a, in an organization such as ours where as mr. Spinney said 70% of our costs relate to, to people and people doing work um, building uh, having an awareness around kind of what 
uh, what we're achieving with the efforts that people are putting in is, is I think, of, is, is equally paramount, if not more paramount. And I would say every organization uh, in the country, uh, you know, is constantly trying to figure out how, with the resources they have, they can they can deliver the best value for citizens, and and for and and, and that value comes both in terms of the quality of health outcomes, but uh, increasingly our ability to create healthy environments that, that prevent illness, um, and our ability just to support people in their health every day. Uh, and I, I think these, uh, the, the, what's really important, just like the conversation around privacy and secure and cybersecurity, information security, that we, when we talk about the tone at the top, I think what's critical is that we establish a culture in the organization that is extremely mindful of the concept that you're talking about. And that's indeed exactly what we're trying to do. My response to the how what have we done differently is we are our first job is to create a leadership culture in the organization that recognizes um, the, the stewardship role that we have and the accountability that we have, not just to be making sure that people are working the hours that they're, that they're booking, but to make sure that their effort is actually delivering some value for Nova Scotians. And so uh, that's, that's, I think, from a culture point of view, it's critical. But then we have to follow that with, with specific, you know, consequences if people aren't, like, you know, like as, it, as it pertains to fraud uh, uh, and, and development for other, you know, for our staff uh, and our teams in terms of how they can ensure that they're delivering the best value. So I think it's a very important concept. Ms. Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, briefly turning to uh, cybersecurity, um, what privacy considerations were weighed when developing the COVID testing strategy? I think as many people, I was struck that I actually got my results from the, the one time I went for a COVID test um, to my Gmail account. I was super happy with that. It was negative. Um, but, but clearly there must have been some deliberation and, and maybe that can help illustrate the progress that has been made since um, this audit in October of last year. Again, briefly if possible. Mr. Nemirovsky. So uh, my team was tasked with devel developing that uh, negative result email process and uh, one of the key activities that we take, uh, undertake when we're developing any new software or process is we, we do a privacy impact assessment uh, in conjunction uh, with the privacy office and then we also do something called a threat risk assessment. And what that does is looks at uh, ways that the system could be infiltrated from an external uh, bad actor, as we call them, um, or the data could be found somewhere else, or the uh, underlying architecture or servers could be hacked. So all that was reviewed uh, by a third party, uh, as well in addition to the privacy impact assessment to make sure the data was safe. Um, and it was also vetted by uh, Department of Health and Wellness. Ms. Roberts. Thank you very much. Um, and so, uh, I assume that here at this committee, I am looking at, um, I guess, the, the heads of the cyber security governance structure that was identified as, as missing in October 2019. Just, just can I make that clear? Mr. Nemirovsky. Uh, I'm gonna say a, a kind of yes. <laughs> um, it, it, is, it is a work in progress. That, that is the work in front of us is really to define who needs to be there, what their roles and responsibilities are, uh, and how that rolls up to Dr. Carr and to our partners at both Nova Scotia Digital and Department of Health and Wellness. Ms. Roberts. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have not um, met very many times in the last eight months, and uh, and we haven't actually had the opportunity to ask any questions related to healthcare um, since I think, 2018, um, there's an outstanding recommendation from a 2017 audit um, that was mentioned in the May 2020 uh, follow-up audit related to um, home care complaints. And I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Carr, if you might be able to address that because we just haven't had an opportunity to, to ask about that. Um, in 2017, the Auditor General uh, raised a number of concerns around home care contracts uh, and, and contract management evaluation uh, of service provider performance. Um, and specifically, there was a recommendation that there should be an integrated record of home support complaints received. That was a recommendation to the Department of Health and Wellness and to the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Um, Anecdotally, we have heard of widespread challenges in home care during COVID, and we know that, in fact, the workforce issues that affect long-term care 
are also very interrelated with the with the labor force issues in um, in home care. So I'm wondering if you can uh, share with me. I guess why that recommendation, at least as of May 2020, has not been completed, and what the consequences of that is in in this particular moment of challenge during COVID. Dr. Kerr, thank you. Um, great question, um, and I'm I'm not familiar with uh, that that specific recommendation. Although I have reviewed the Auditor General's previous reports, uh, that uh, that one eluded me. Um, and as I think you're, you're aware, as you indicated, the, um, the, the healthcare environment is a little bit complicated in Nova Scotia where home care, long-term care are largely under the jurisdiction of the Department of Health and Wellness, which means in terms of managing the day-to-day -day relationships with home care providers, et cetera, it would generally be our colleagues at the Department of Health and Wellness who would be uh, interacting with, uh, with, our, with those providers. That being said, from the point of view of the, the average citizen of Nova Scotia, we think like a system, and um, uh, and we uh, are. I think I would agree uh, with what I think the, the the spirit of your your comment, which is uh, it you know it matters to people just as much in home their experience in home care as as in the hospital system. So um, I. I think so. I can't speak to where we are vis-a-vis -vis that specific recommendation and uh, how we're advancing that. But I I um, I, I would agree though that. Uh, I think COVID is uh, one of the one of the things that we're learning through COVID is it, it is emphasizing the fact that uh, our ability to effectively, with good quality uh, and reliably, provide support to people in their homes is critical to to a high functioning health system. And so, uh, it is an area that uh, was recently uh, also underscored in a report that was done in the long term care sector. Uh, and I think that there is, uh, is is a general commitment on the part of the Department of Health and Nova Scotia Health Authority to work collaboratively to. Try to, to, to try to improve this. Ms. Roberts. Okay, thank you. And I'll have to review again uh, that um, report from November 2017 to understand exactly why that, that recommendation is joint to the NSHA and to the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Um, but I, I think um, I'm glad to have at least brought your attention uh, back to it. Um, I'm going to return then to the October uh, 2019 uh, report. Um, the AG report identified five significant control weaknesses. Um, is there is there specific progress that you haven't spoken to in terms of um, capital asset additions um, that that you'd like to share with us in terms of the progress that's been made, Mr. Spinney? Thank you. So the five that you mentioned, uh, I've touched on two already. So one was the time reporting. One was the uh, internal control environment being incomplete, where we talked about kind of the tail end of that chronological process uh, being completed now. And then the other three were capital related, as you pointed out. And those three uh, are no longer um, in our last audit significant deficiencies. So the AG audit uh, auditors have um, downgraded that, if you will. Uh, there's still a, a note, um, uh, a weakness identified there. And the three aspects around it, um, even though we've done a lot of work with them and it has now been downgraded, um, the three things in particular are that we don't currently have a system uh, to monitor uh, our capital assets, like a, a computerized system, if you will. And so the risk there is, and Brendan would have used uh, some of this in his opening, is a CT scanner, for instance. So when you're trying to figure out your controls, you figure out what's the risk. So what's the risk that a CT scanner is going to disappear, if you will? Uh, the risk would be lower, obviously, than, than if it was a, an ultrasound, which is a much smaller box that somebody could actually get into a van, if you will, uh, and it could disappear. So a system would help track the physical location of where all of those things are. Um, that is really a function of kind of where we've come from, and, and we simply don't have a computerized system to do that. Uh, that said, what we have implemented this year, and we'll be going through uh, with Mr. McPhee's team later as, as he commences the audit this year, uh, is a, not a computerized system, but a process that, that people are running uh, that we interact with all of the cost center owners of the equipment so that we do know what is where, if you will. Uh, the second part was around uh, impairment. So what is our regular uh, review process to ensure that um, if, if an item is to be impaired, that, that you are in fact um, 
doing that, um, you know, reducing the amount that you've got on your balance sheet for it. And then the third one is around disposal. So if you've disposed of an asset, it should be taken off of your balance sheet, if you will. And so what is our process to ensure that um, when an item is disposed, that accounting knows so that it can come off of our balance sheet. So again, there is this process that we'll be going through with the AG this year uh, that attempts to, um, not through a computerized system yet, although we are looking at that as well, uh, but at least a process where we can say we've engaged the owners, if I can call them that, of the equipment uh, and the assets, and we engage with them to understand should it be impaired, has it been disposed, what, what is the current state? So if you were to look at our balance sheet um, from our financial statements, you'd see that we have about a billion dollars in assets and about 141 million of that is medical equipment. Most of the rest is really buildings. So a lot easier to, to kind of deal with that, if you will. Um, so that just kind of gives you a sense as to kind of, you know, what, what are we talking about here in the, in the capital piece? Um, that's a billion dollars, 141 million is, is medical equipment, and that is a large part of what we're focusing on with this process to ensure we know uh, what is where, what is its current state, and should it be removed from the balance sheet. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pick up on some of the comments around um, control around time, controls around, around time reporting, and, and particularly your comments about sick time. And of course, COVID must have thrown all sort of previous benchmarks for what is um, typical sick time right off the rails for many different reasons, including um, uh, including for parents who uh, lost childcare, for parents who now have children back in school and are um, like like all parents, whether they're in the healthcare system or not, um, encountering you know delays related to testing for uh, for their kids if they have the sniffles. Um, so so how are you? Um, I guess maintaining controls while recognizing the uh, the circumstances that we're all facing. Mr. Speedy, it's it's a great question, and I think I'm I'm proud of this as a Nova Scotian, but uh, it depends on your perspective, I suppose. But um, when we look at our, uh, I'll start with vacation time, and and then we'll get into sick time, which I won't be able to be as specific with the numbers. Um, but with our vacation time this year, uh, our fiscal starts April 1st, of course, and really that's kind of when we were uh, knee deep into it with COVID. Um, between April 1st and the end of September, uh, we have had us we we've seen uh, a, a very large reduction in vacation time that's actually been taking. So um, kind of like uh, when a fire is on, a firefighter runs into the building while everybody's running out. Well, the Nova Scotia Health actually ran into COVID while many people were, were able to thankfully uh, stay the blazes home, if you will. And so for us, it is something that we're very much monitoring. Is, uh, and in fact, one of our uh, very large planning focuses is around the um, human resource uh, that we have because that is so dependent. In fact, it's the most dependent variable that we have in our planning right now for the second wave and all of these things. So we're very carefully monitoring who is taking vacation Although we are proud, if you will, on the same time, we completely understand that there needs to be a work-life balance. So we're trying to follow up with people to ensure that they are getting the time that they need and the supports that they need as well. Um, and in sick time, I don't have the number to quote, I believe uh, that it's actually down uh, as well. It's actually not so intuitively, I would have expected it to go up. Um, and in fact, it's actually gone down during COVID time. Um, I'm purely speculating at this point, but I, it, you know, my own personal speculation is that it's for the same reason. People just feel the ownership that uh, we need to be here for Nova Scotians. Um, so that's, that's kind of been our experience so far. Ms. Roberts with about two and a half minutes left. Uh, well, maybe I would um, ask Mr. Carr if he'd like to comment on that because I'm I'm trying to read facial signals from um, behind a mask, which is challenging, but I get the sense. <laughs> Dr. Carr. 
Well, and um, first of all, I think, you, you, again, your question is a very uh, important question for us. And uh, let me uh, come at it just a, uh, in a little bit of a different direction. Um, like everybody in Nova Scotia, uh, COVID has, uh, has uh, you know, has created unprecedented strains and stresses on us in terms of our professional life and our home lives and our community lives and, and all of our staff live that every day in their personal lives and have the added, um, um, you know, responsibility of being, you know, trying to keep the health system uh, running every day and, and doing what they do for Nova Scotians. And so uh, I, we know that our teams are um, highly committed and, and that they, um, that they, uh, have a great, a great sense of, of, of privilege in the work that they do and a great sense of purpose in serving the people of Nova Scotia. Uh, and they sometimes do that to the point of self-harm, quite frankly. So we have, we have people who are, have not been able to take vacation or um, we've probably had people, and not, not somebody with symptoms of COVID, but other people who may in fact be um, coming to work every day when they would have maybe normally had a normal doctor's appointment or something like that, and they're, and they're continuing to come to work because our, our frontline teams need to be, uh, they need to be present. They've been, at the same time, uh, um, they've been the people that have been uh, standing up our testing sites and our assessment centers. They've been, um, in the last number of months, uh, trying not just to continue or reintroduce services, but to catch up on, on people who have been lost. They, they are working extremely hard. They deserve all of our um, acknowledgement. And, uh, and I think it would, and it's borne out in these statistics that, uh, that uh, they do that with a tremendous sense of commitment to the people of Nova Scotia. Ms. Roberts, uh, 18 seconds. Uh, Again, thanks, thanks very much. And I know that my colleague will have um, more questions uh, after the Liberal Caucus. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now we'll move on to the Liberal Caucus for 20 minutes. We'll start off with uh, Ms. Di Costanzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for all the information. It's been uh, a wonderful uh, understanding a lot of it. Um, in the auditor's report, uh, they, they mentioned, uh, well, they referenced clinical and non-clinical programs. Could you just expand on that and let us know what the difference and how it affects maybe the, the staff as well? Thank you. Mr. Nevorowski. So, to delineate the two, uh, we take a clinical system as one that's being more uh, patient-facing, so something where we enter lab information, results, documentation, uh, x-rays, that would, that would classify as a clinical system. The non-clinical systems would be things that support business process like SAP, um, a time tracking system, uh, th those are the, the kinds of things, Microsoft suite of, of products, those would all be non-clinical, so that, that's how we delineate the two. It sometimes is grey, because some systems cross the border, but we, we try and use those as our metric. Mr. Costanzo. And in which one takes more of your effort in, in regards to cyber um, attacks, and wh where, where do you concentrate your efforts? Mr. Nebrowski. They're split pretty evenly. Um, Cyber criminals um, look at healthcare overall. They don't sort of delineate between clinical versus non clinical. They look for any opportunity to get into the system to wreak havoc. Um, their favorite mode of entry is email, so that's the one we spend a lot of time working on. Uh, myself, my team, the privacy office under Karen Hornberger, uh, and Nova Scotia Digital spend an inordinate amount of time monitoring and uh, mitigating email risks. Mr. Costanzo. Thank you. So that brings me to another question in regards to passwords. Is there um, a way that uh, passwords are more complicated than my passwords, for example? I find them really difficult to remember all and where I put them. How do you manage that within the health system? Mr. Nowrowski. So we... Uh at this point, I've done a lot of work around passwords. Uh, it, it was a finding in one of the recent audits that we need to do some work on that. So my team has been looking at, uh, at passwords across the organization, both clinical and non-clinical, um, doing an assessment of uh, what the complexity is that's required in those systems, uh, what the current provincial standard is, um, and working to 
bring our systems up to that standard if possible. Uh, some of the issue that we run into is that many of our systems are fairly old um, and as such, they don't actually support the standard. Uh, so we're working on the ones, especially the ones that are tied closely to the financial systems to make sure that they have the most security um, and the ones that have patient data. But again, we, we are bound by the limitations of the software, um, but we are actively working to bring all of those up to at least that, that provincial standard. And, and there is work afoot at a provincial level to modify that standard. It has been delayed due to other work um, with the province at Nova Scotia Digital, so we're waiting for that new standard to come and then we will reevaluate where we're at. Um, but we are actively working to bring things up to that level. Mr. Costanzo. And when you said this, the new standards or the standards that you're hoping for, where are we in, in comparison to other provinces? Where will that bring us once you have that kind of standard? Mr. Nevorovsky. I, I don't actually have the answer to that question because uh, we don't know what the new standard looks like. Um, it's being set out by, by Nova Scotia Digital and, and Service Nova Scotia, so we are kind of uh, waiting for them to give us the standard and we'll work towards it. They'd probably be best to comment on where that is in terms of relation to other jurisdictions. Mr. Costanzo. One last question and then I'll pass it on to my colleague. Um, there was also the reference for... Um, networks and clouds uh, and the locations of them and how uh, w what are you using and if you can explain to somebody like me uh, why would you use a cloud over network thank you mr nabrowski so um the term cloud gets thrown around a lot all it really is is a data center run and managed by someone else. So the, the, the Microsoft Cloud, Azure is what they call it, it is just a number of data centers scattered around the world. Uh, in Canada, I believe there's three for Microsoft that uh, we call the cloud. It is just a very fancy, uh, relatively easy to use uh, set of servers and networking equipment that we as consumers um, can, can access. Um, we have our own data center as well, or a number of them actually, in the province, uh, run by Nova Scotia Digital. And that is where 99 plus percent of our data and applications are stored. There is a shift happening to more cloud-based software, uh, and that's because that's where the vendors are headed. Um, a lot of them are moving to cloud-based solutions. It does allow for uh, less complexity. Uh, from a, a technology perspective that we need to manage here in the province because we give that technical work to that vendor and then we actually just manage the software that's on the server. So it actually makes the work simpler from a technical perspective. Um, but we're, we're not there yet. There, um, there's work afoot to make sure they're secure. Um, that is being done in conjunction with Nova Scotia Digital to make sure that they're, uh, they have appropriate firewalls and antivirus and that we're comfortable putting patient data or applications up there. Okay, uh, Mr. Stanz. Sorry, one last one. And now that with COVID and people working from home, how did you manage that and, and to keep it uh, from cyber attacks while, while people working from home? Thanks. Mr. Nevorowski. Uh, we did a number of things to, to facilitate people working from home. Um, we took actually a lot of physical devices that we had on site. We actually sent home securely with staff because they're fully encrypted. They have a uh, encrypted connection back to the uh, hospital system. Um, so that was one way we did it. Uh, the other way was through something called virtual desktops. So we, uh, in conjunction with Nova Scotia Digital, uh, set up an expanded pool of virtual desktops. And what that allows someone to do, um, you, you could be working at home, you log into a secure site with your secure login and password, it encrypts everything on that connection but it gives you access to all of the clinical applications that you need, even though you're from home. So it facilitated physicians, nurse practitioners, and others to continue to be able to see patients remotely, right from their home. Everything was done in the computer information system, um, and it was all on a secure connection. So it, it helped them maintain as much service as possible in a, what was a very trying time for everyone. Okay, we'll move on now to Ms. Lonis Craft. Thank you, and uh, it's uh, interesting to hear some of these updates. Um, I, I'd like to talk uh, um, or get some information on um, 
the proposed one person, one record. It's, um, we've heard a lot of build up for it and there seems to be excitement, especially with the amalgamation of, of all the different um, health um, um, districts that uh, ha are now one. Um, where are we in the timeline? And um, as part of that, I'd like to know where the risk management has fit in or where it's fitting in. Dr. Kerr. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Vice Chair, for your question. Um, uh, so the, the, in, in terms of the timeline of the process around one person, one record, uh, we are, um, uh, we're at the end of uh, essentially the procurement phase uh, from, a, uh, from a procurement point of view where uh, over the last number of months uh, and years, in fact, there's been work done around identifying vendors who could uh, meet the needs that have been uh, articulated around uh, this uh, clinical information system. And that process is working through government. Uh, and I understand that is, it is uh, nearing its completion, having uh, evaluated various vendors, looked at the total cost of ownership, looked you know, at, at, uh, at, at those kinds of issues. And, and that process will lead to, I think, a, a decision by you know, Treasury Board Cabinet within, uh, within the near future, uh, notionally. Uh, on the on the health system side, um, while we've contributed to um, uh, the specifications around the system, like from the point of view of what is it that we're trying to achieve here? Why is this important? What, do, what would we need a system like this to do, like to help us with? Um, a lot of the work that has been going on within the health system has been around uh, um, what we call readiness work, where uh, it's, it's looking at how do we create the conditions in our organization uh, and what kind of work could we do on the front end of this to, to really streamline and to flatten the change curve for people uh, as, we, as we're heading into uh, implementation, should we, you know, should we uh, move in that direction. Uh, so, so from a timeline point of view, we've done a lot of front end work around understanding what the, what the needs of the system would be, identifying potential vendors, working through a process around the total cost for this, and that is, we're at the, we're at the penultimate point where that will be a decision made by government, uh, and, we, and the work that we're doing in the system has been largely around then readying the system around, um, around implementing a system like this. Ms. Lovelace Craft. Oh, I think... Mr. Dubrovsky. You're going to have to repeat that for me, though, <laughs> the second part. The risk management, what, what process it is at um, during this, and, and what do you hope to have in place? Mr. Dubrovsky. So uh, throughout the procurement, um, we, we've engaged um, a vendor to, to assist a third party um, independent vendor to uh, advise on all those risks around procurement around the system about uh, how it's going to be implemented. There'll be more work that happens once we identify who that vendor is, if, if one ultimately gets approved by Treasury Board. So there's, there's not much we can really talk about until we know who that is, because depending on how they implement and what the actual approved schedule looks like, that will uh, speak to those risks and, and allow us to mitigate more uh, as we understand exactly how we're going to roll out, what modules are going to come, uh, what uh, processes will change. Um, but we, we really need that vendor name so that we can start to do a lot of that assessment with them because it will be very much a partnership. Ms. Lovelace Craft. Do you have any goals in your mind that you would like to see put in place with risk management? Mr. Nabrowski. Uh So uh, I think one of the biggest goals of, of the One Patient on Market program is to make sure that clinicians have access to the patient information they need to provide the best possible care. So from a risk perspective, that's one of the ones we're looking to mitigate is that risk of, of not having the right information at the right time to provide care. Because as, as I'm sure you're aware, we have a, a disparate number of systems across the organization, um, all from the different DHAs and whatnot, where p physicians and clinicians need to go to multiple systems to get the information. So OPR by itself is a risk mitigation in and of itself, because it allows that consolidation of that information to one single source. Um, there are risks implementing any software program, um, but again, that's why that vendor needs to be on board so we can work with them to identify those, make sure we have the right plans in place um, as we look to roll that out. But it, it really is somewhat um, vendor dependent because the risks change. Ms. Lowe's Um 
So are you working on a comms plan to um, educate the public on how you're going to protect their information? Um, is that in the works? Mr. Nebrovsky. So I don't know that the OPOR program changes our perspective on patient uh, data safety or how we safeguard it. it, it it's just a different piece of software. Um, as we've talked, the privacy office under Mrs. Hornberger have done a lot of work around policy changes to make sure we're, we're keeping patient data safe. Uh, we manage patient data on a day-to-day -day basis. My department uh, also houses the health information um, department. So we are always making sure we have patient data uh, stored appropriately. We control access to it. That doesn't change with OPOR. It's just a different tool to help us manage that patient information. So we already have a lot of that in hand. Dr. Kerr. Uh, add a, uh, uh, to my colleague's response. So um, on the question of uh, risks, I guess I'd like to kind of look at that from another perspective. There certainly are risks that we're very aware of in terms of, you know, the risks associated with a significant, you know, uh, a change initiative in, in a large complex organization. Uh, and we have an extensive governance structure that's been designed around those risks that includes all of our partners we've talked about, that, that includes the Department of Health and Wellness, Digital Services, uh, and our board. Uh, there are also some risks to, I think your question are the particular risks that we're, like we're aware of many risks, but there are also some very tangible risks that we're trying to address with this, with the one patient or one person, one record system. And those are largely risks around, um, you know, inconsistencies in information that lead to, you know, that support, you know, or don't support good clinical decision making. There are huge, you know, the, the, the third leading cause of mortality in Canada and North America and the world is really system-related uh, error. Um, sometimes we refer to it as medical error, but it's not really the, it's not a, it's not a physician's error, it's the system. Uh, and when you think about the complexity of our system, there are many, many risks inherent in our system, like particularly with medication management and things like that. So these systems are very specifically intended to reduce those kinds of risks that translate into fewer deaths and, 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 and less harm to patients every day. So there are, so when we, when, so when you're, when you ask a question around risk, there are risks around the implementation of this, but there's also what are the risks that we're trying to improve? And those are largely patient safety and quality risks that we feel uh, are, you know, there are, where there are tangible uh, opportunities for benefit. In, in terms of um, the, you know, uh, in terms of the, uh, the environment with our with our citizens and, and, and members of our community, absolutely, this will constitute a significant shift, uh, and it will be something that uh, will change the way that people interact with their own health information and the way that their providers are interacting with health information. So we will absolutely, and we have, you know, we've started to, but we've been in this readiness phase. But as we would move into implementation, we would absolutely contemplate a very active process by which we would be, in, you know, we would be engaging with with our communities and with citizens both to make them aware of what's coming, but also to seek their, you know, to seek their input. And it's really important that they understand not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it, like why this is important for them. Because, because no matter how we do it, this will be disruptive in our system for a period of time. Uh, and it's important that people understand why it is that we're doing this uh, in terms of the benefits that we expect to realize, certainly from a quality point of view, a safety point of view, quality of, of data, and the ability of that, of that data to support individuals in managing their own care and decision making in healthcare going forward. Forward. Mr. Lundenscroft. Yes. Um, I'd like to move on to um, just um, Dr. Carr, you mentioned um, about the handling, you know, the, the fraud uh, risk management being put in where large sums of money. And um, um, our foundations um, and all our uh, regions have them, and even some are within regions. <laughs> you know, I know I, I represent Lunenburg and South Shore. Uh, regional has their foundation, but there's a little uh, Fisherman's Memorial Foundation as well. So how are you looking at risk management with all these different, you know, they all have their own uh, treasurers and, and, and um, um, uh, committees and whatnot, yet we're one health authority. So how, how are you managing that risk? Um, because there are large sums of money, millions of dollars in these accounts, and you know, there's a big procurement piece with that, and I'd just like to hear how that's being handled now. Dr. Kerr. 
very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Spinney might have uh, something to add to this. Uh, just to, to acknowledge that uh, is um, um, as a material, uh, you know, uh, concern and uh, issue uh, that there, we are talking about large sums of money, and they're and they're they're and they are citizens' donations to support health care. And so this is they, this is important. Um, we uh, under our, our our the offices of our board we engage with uh, with all of our foundations, uh, both Mr. Spinney and another one of our vice presidents have kind of managed our direct relationships with our with our uh, foundation partners, uh, and issues like uh, uh, how we safeguard those resources, how we ensure that we are uh, you know accounting for these resources in a way that is uh, you know consistent with with uh, generally accepted. Um, Principles, etc., are all matters that we deal with on a on a on an ongoing basis with our foundations, uh, and I, you know feel that is 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 a kind of an extension of the work that we do that it's important. But I don't know, uh, Derek, if you wanted to. to Mr. Spinney. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I saw a stat one time that 500,000 Nova Scotians have donated to a foundation, and so that that speaks volumes uh, to the engagement that we have in this province and how important it is in all the different communities. Uh, they, they know best their local uh, environment and, and what is needed and how they're bringing that together for us. And it is, uh, you know, it's, it's over $10 million a year that they would actually contribute uh, for medical equipment specifically, for instance. And so what we do is we, we do have a dual partnership, uh, as Brendan just mentioned, myself and our Vice President of Research and Innovation, uh, who meet with the foundations uh, to ensure that they have that one-on-one -on -one contact, that they understand uh, what we see as the future uh, needs in the different areas, and that they're actually able to, to speak into that so that we can have this, this two-way dialogue. Um, I also meet on a regular basis with Stephen Harding, uh, and he, not only does he chair the uh, Dartmouth General Foundation, but he also chairs the Association of Foundations across the province. And so just uh, two weeks ago, actually, while I was over there, what we were talking about in the cafeteria was around payroll uh, for the foundations. So we've, Nova Scotia Health, have brought forward to him uh, an opportunity that he's taking back to his organizations around a shared service for payroll um, and those sorts of things. Because as you said, the level of sophistication in the foundations can be very different. You know, if you're one of the larger ones, say, in HRM versus, um, you know, uh, you know, the South Shore or Soldiers Memorial. And so we're, we're in, encouraging and providing options, but, but really as an interested partner, because it is also very important to understand that we are completely distinct organizations. Like we are legally distinct. We have separate bank accounts. Uh, we have separate uh, policies, these sorts of things. And so that delineation is, is very important that, that we're able to keep that. They have their own boards that, that are responsible for their stewardship and governance. Um, but we work very closely with them to ensure that uh, even, for instance, if a foundation was to say we'd like to raise a million dollars to contribute towards something, if we enter into an arrangement with them to say, okay, let's go do that. That's, that's a great thing. Let's do that together. Um, we uh, encourage feasibility studies through the different uh, foundations so that they uh, are not biting off more than they can chew, if you will, to, to put it that way, uh, and a bit of a payment schedule so that we can actually understand that this is, this is a viable thing. And this, this isn't out of a place of mistrust. In fact, it's the opposite. It, we, we need the partnership to be uh, very productive for everybody. We, we want it to be successful. So we do spend a lot of time uh, mentoring, if I can put it that way, but not being directly responsible at, at the same time. Okay, uh, the time for the Liberal Caucus has expired at this point, and we'll take a 15-minute break. We'll come back to our seats around uh, 10.31, and we'll do the second round, and we'll have the division of time after that. So we'll back here at 10.31. At 10 Thank you.
order, please. We'll call the committee back to order and we'll begin the second round of questioning to the witnesses. And uh, this second round will be eight minutes per caucus. So we'll start off, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've certainly established that uh, cybersecurity is, is paramount to Nova Scotians as a concern. Uh, one thing I've noted as in my three years as an MLA is how you know, large Nova Scotia Health Authority is. And with respect to that, I think it's fair to conclude that information sharing uh, is a critical success factor in improving uh, health care delivery. So to that end, is there a plan to report uh, to Nova Scotians on the progress uh, to demonstrate accountability and transparency uh, for the implementation plan that you've, you've outlined here today? Mr. Nebrowski. Uh, I just want to clarify, implementation plan for... Mr. Hammond. As it relates to cybersecurity, as it relates to cybersecurity, you've outlined a framework that you're that you're working with. Um, I've cited a couple of examples where there's been uh, breaches. Uh, I believe Nova Scotians want to know, uh, you know, they want a progress report. Will you commit to a progress report uh, in the name of accountability and transparency? Mr. Nebrowski. So I, don't, I don't know that I can commit to one personally. Uh, that would be a discussion with Derek and I, but um, I can commit to absolutely, you know, uh, putting in, uh, doing the work to make sure we have a framework that, that does support the safety and security of, of patients' information and, and our systems. Um, and, and as we've said, that work is, is almost to completion in terms of the initial assessment with that third-party vendor um, coming in to make the recommendations that we then need to take back up through uh, internal governance that has us, Nova Scotia Digital, and Department of Health and Wellness at the table to make sure that we're all in alignment with that plan moving forward because it's going to require resources from all three organizations to uh, make a, a robust cybersecurity uh, framework a reality. Um, it, it's not just us. We need to work with those two partners because we're so closely linked. Mr. Spinney. To, just to add to what Andrew was saying there as well, uh, we are taking this, uh, so our stop along the way is to our finance and audit committee who helps us with the governance to ensure that you know they agree with, with the progress and the steps. And, and then um, progress updates, I, I think, are quite reasonable. Uh, and in fact, somewhat that is what we're doing here today through public accounts and the Auditor General uh, helps uh, very, very well with that, in fact, uh, with their reports and the performance audits uh, and their engagement. So uh, I can certainly take back to see if there's something that we can do more proactively as well. We're certainly open to that idea for sure because, as you outlined, it, it is very important for sure. Mr. Hump. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, certainly what we've all learned during the COVID experience is timely, consistent updates are, are critical. And to that end, if cybersecurity fraud risk management is paramount, uh, let's see those actions and behavior that align with those uh, with, with rhetoric such as that. Um, and, and to that point, I mean, even, you know, my understanding this summer um, in the Eastern Passage at Ocean View, uh, the, the, the computer systems were shut down uh, for, for three weeks. Um, why were those computer systems shut down? Mr. Dabrowski. I'm not actually familiar with Ocean View. I don't know that it's a actual NSHA run site. Um, it, it definitely doesn't fall under my portfolio, so I, I'm thinking they're independent. Um, can you speak Dr. to it? Dr. Kerr. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, Ocean View is a is a is a large um, uh, uh, long term care facility on the eastern shore. They're they're um, not part of the Nova Scotia Health family, as it were, uh, and so we it would be difficult for us to to to, to speak specifically to uh, anything that happened with respect to their um, to their information systems at any point in time. Mr. Hom. I use it as an example to illustrate how critical it is to, to give updates, um, to let Nova Scotians know what is going on, to be upfront as to you know, the nature of these breaches, uh, to be upfront what plan is going to be put into place uh, to ensure mitigation uh, of these, of these uh, incidents. Um, of course, this being public accounts, uh, I'm curious if there's an understanding of what level of investment is required to achieve the, the framework you've laid out here today? Uh, do you have a, uh, a projected uh, expenditure that you can divulge to Nova Scotians? 
Mr. Nivarovsky. Uh At this point, we don't know the full cost. Um, as I said, the, the report is preliminary at this point. Um, there are some very high-level recommendations that are going to come out of it. The, uh, the reason I don't really know is because so much of the work uh, is going to be done in conjunction with Nova Scotia Digital, uh, and they have a significant piece to play and need to f factor in their costs uh, if the recommendation is endorsed by the, the Governance Committee. Uh, so we, we need to take it there first, get the um, Finance and Audit Committee of the Board is also, also to sign off, but um, there's still more work to do to flesh out what's reasonable. Um, and it's probably going to require a reconfiguration on both our side and Nova Scotia Digital's to, to make these recommendations a reality. So there's still more work to do to determine what those full costs are. Mr. Hum. And what's the established time frame to arrive at those projected numbers? Mr. Nevrovsky. So our report should be back in the next three weeks. That's, that's the date we have from uh, uh, our group that we're working with. Uh, and that is just the Nova Scotia health portion. Um, we then need to work with our partners at Nova Scotia Digital to determine what, what else they need. I don't know what their timeline is. I know they're actively reviewing their, their program, but uh, I can't comment on their timeline and when they're going to have a, a final um, suggestion put forward. Mr. Alban was about a minute and a half left. Because, thank you, Mr. Chair, and because um, cybersecurity, fraud risk management is uh, of paramount importance to Nova Scotians, will you commit to uh, divulging uh, the, that estimated cost uh, to arrive at this framework uh, for Nova Scotians? When will, we, when will we know the numbers? Mr. Nevorovsky. Uh, so ours will, will work with the board, and I think that's probably a reasonable thing to share, um, but it is, you know, a portion of a, of a larger program that needs to be put in place. So, you know, it would be couched with that caveat, but I think we can probably share what our recommendation will be. M Mr. Harmon, one minute. Uh, with, with, respect to, um, with respect to the Privacy Commissioner's report of 2018, uh, she highlighted uh, issues pertaining to uh, time limits for prosecution. Uh, two years is the typical time for other provincial offences. Um, will the Public Health Information Act be amended to lengthen the timelines for prosecution under this act for a, for a breach? Are you looking at that as a, in terms of deterrence and consequences? I believe that will be the responsibility of the Department of Health and Wellness, and they are undergoing a three-year review of the Personal Health Information Act. I can't speak specifically whether or not that's something they're looking at changing. That would be a question for that group. Thank you. The time for the PC caucus has expired. We'll go now to the NDP caucus. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this discussion so far. Um, I just want to ask a couple quick questions about the AG report. Um, so uh, we were happy to see that the audit, that the audit policy around assessing personal health uh, in information was created since the AG report last October. Um, wondering if you can talk quickly about an um, evaluation plan, like an internal value evaluation plan uh, that would be put in place for the audit policy. So how, basically how are you knowing, how are we all knowing uh, if uh, the efforts to create a privacy conscious environment are working internally? Ms. Hornberger. Thank you. Um, we do track our privacy breach numbers, um, the numbers reported for day-to-day -day breaches are much lower. Um, part of that is because of the reduction in service uh, due to COVID, um, but I think some of it is as an effect of our education to our staff members. Um, we, as far as the auditing goes, we're still working on our implementation of our annual auditing policy and looking to improve the types of audits we do at a re on a regular basis. And as part of our operational plan, we are looking at measuring how many audits are completed on a quarterly basis and report that up through to our vice president. Ms. LeBlanc. Great, thank you. And I apologize if this was uh, asked before. I just want to clarify, though. I, 
I feel like maybe it was, but um, in the AG report of 2019, um, uh, it was noted that fraud training is not available to all NSHA employees, but have you addressed that? It, it, is, it, uh, is it now available for all employees? Mr. Spinney. Will be by the end of December 2020, like this calendar year. Uh, so it wasn't at the time of that uh, report, absolutely. And um, you know, th uh, thanks to the support of the AG's office and the method that they used to bring that forward, uh, we have in fact uh, agreed to that, and it will be rolled out. Uh, the content is do done. The website's just kind of waiting to be turned on, if you will. So, Ms. LeBlanc. Great. Thank you. I just want to, um, again, my colleague uh, uh, commented that we haven't seen anyone from the, from the health, Nova Scotia Health for many months, and so I just wanted to ask a couple of more questions uh, related to the current pandemic. Um, the recent quality review from Northwood uh, asked for a province-wide healthcare system response for pandemics. For instance, if we enter a second wave and have to redeploy staff from acute care to continuing care, for example. Um, the, in the uh, department's second wave plan for the continuing care sector released last week, it also highlights the need for health, health workforce surge capacity and mechanisms that support health workforce redeployment. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what those plans look like so far. Um, and uh, if, well, yes. <laughs> Dr. Kerr. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's nice to be missed. So thanks for your question. Um, um, yeah, no. There, uh, I think uh, there, you know, there's a there's been a collective recognition and, and understanding that uh, you know, the, you know, the extent to which we respond as a system is key to our success. You know, dealing with an issue like the, like like the pandemic, uh, and we certainly recognized uh, uh, right up front that uh, health human resources are, are are pivotal, and so we've um, so part of that planning involves um, there's been uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, training undertaken to train new individuals so that they would be prepared to work within this sector, both um, uh, people that have uh, clinical training as well as non-clinical backgrounds. Like, so if you, if you look at some of our, um, you know, some of the work that we do in terms of uh, testing sites and assessment centers, some of the front end work does not require clinical skills. It's really just, uh, you know, it's more logistics and intake. Uh, and so from a scarce resource point of view, it makes more sense for us to be trying to train other people to do that kind of work so that our clinical staff can be doing the true clinical work. So there's been, so we've been basically trying to build the workforce. We've been working on the notion of creating employment centers. So rather than each individual facility having to try to manage their own uh, human resources, uh, particularly if they're in the midst of uh, you know, like a challenging situation like an outbreak, we're, we're, we're creating essentially centers around the province who will uh, provide sort of more collective support to, to, um, to uh, facilities within their zone. Uh, likewise, uh, the, the uh, approach uh, contemplates the the designation of zone of, of facilities within the zones that would uh, would uh, be places where residents of either long term care uh, who who were positive could go to be looked after. So uh, sort of regional kind of uh, treatment sites, uh, and so uh, part of that plan is also around developing the resource uh, uh, supports that would that 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 will allow that to happen. Uh, so there's. There's quite a bit of work going on in, in the area of HR, and I think it's one of the areas that we recognize this. I think Mr. Spinney said earlier is, is key to our success. Minutes left. Thanks. Um, um, I'm wondering if uh, you can talk a little bit of, in the same vein, a little bit about the uh, backlogs in hospital procedures. Um, uh, you know, mammograms and colonoscopies and blood testing and that kind of thing. Um, you know, we, I understand that during the first wave we were lucky not to have our hospitals overwhelmed, which we are hearing now about in uh, Upper Canada is happening quite a lot. Um, and that's because of the hard work of Nova Scotians. Um, but can you explain to us what the strategy was in the first wave and give us the update of where we would be to get back to normal? And again, uh, pause that and, you know, where we are if we need to, if we do enter a second wave. Dr. Kerr. And two minutes or less. So, um, uh, so I think we're all familiar. Like uh, you know, uh, just you know, to roll back the clock, we responded like virtually every other uh, jurisdiction when this was coming. We didn't really know what it was going to bring, and we and we were very focused on creating capacity within the acute care sector because we thought that we were going to be we were going to experience what had been experienced in Italy and in New York and other places. Um, 
that is not how we're approaching the second wave. So, we, so, so the benefit of that was we we had capacity and we were and we demonstrated that we were effectively able to do that across the province. Worked very well, and I, I would say that that we also recognize a number of unintended consequences of that, both in terms of people who were not able to access regular services during that period of time, as well as other things, you know, the, like like how. The, uh, the very strict restrictions around visitation and things like that actually had a huge impact on patients, on their families, on caregivers, and on, on the health of our community. So these are important things that we've been thinking about as we're moving into the second wave. So in the second wave, we're, we're taking more what I would say is an incremental approach. And, and rather than sort of think of the, of the province as a single unit, we are thinking about it more geographically. Uh, and we're developing, so we're, we're developing more of an approach that would be a scaled approach, depending upon what's happening within a community, keeping in mind the need to balance both the ongoing provision of services and the ability to respond to COVID. And there will be some scaling in that depending upon what's happening in a particular area. But our objective is to try to do, uh, you know, is to try to um, minimize the amount of disruption of ongoing services. Uh, so in the first wave, just for everybody, you know, for the record, we were able to maintain cancer services. Uh, we increased the number of mental health and addiction services that were provided to people in the province. So, and which was really important. On the other side, orthopedic surgery, not so much. Like we, you know, so, so we are being mindful of continuing important things that we know are impacting people in Nova Scotia, while at the same time developing a plan that will allow us to escalate should we require, be required to in a given zone, depending upon the conditions related to COVID, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. The time for the NDP caucus has expired, and we'll give the final eight minutes to the Liberal caucus. Ms. Lona Scroft. Thank you. I'd just like to finish up with my little topic. Um, I was pleased to see that you, you do have the um, whistleblower line and email. Um, I wonder, you know, I've worked in organizations where we've intentionally set some very good policies, but a lot of people didn't know we had them. And, uh, very, you know, so how are you communicating the whistleblower with um, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, and, and I'd like to extend that to the foundations and community health boards. How do, do they know? Um, do individuals know who, who sit on those boards and, and whatnot? Mr. Spinney. So it's a great question. There's a few things that, that we've done. First of all, uh, Brendan communicated with the organization in March. Uh, that was followed up with a second communication by our senior director of human resources in June, uh, as well as there's actually posters around, if you will. So one of those, you know, you get on the elevator and you kind of see the poster. Uh, so those are some of the ways that, that we're um, encouraging and educating internally. Um, it's, it's interesting as well that you had mentioned the other parties because it is everybody's kind of responsibility, everybody that touches us. And so to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what we have done with the foundation. So that is something that I'll, I'll be taking away from this is just to, to check on that because it's, uh, it's a really good point and something that we can, we can easily facilitate, so. Ms. Lona Scroft. Um, I'll hand it over to Mr. Jessen. Mr. Jessen. Thank you, folks. Appreciate your time through the chair. Um, excuse me here. Uh, Dr. Carr indicated that uh, the organization as a whole is, you know, upwards of 40,000 uh, strong. Uh, I'm curious about how how large a faction the cybersecurity team would be um, within that 40,000 through the chair. Dr. Kerr? To Mr. Nimorowski, I'll just say a small but mighty is probably the, uh, the, the but uh, Mr. Nimorowski can give you more details. Mr. Nimorowski. So, uh, as I said, the, the, the findings are still in draft from our, our partner. Um, the team is going to be small but mighty. Um, the, the thing to remember is that it's not just uh, the team within Nova Scotia Health. It is uh, truly a partnership with Nova Scotia Digital. Uh, they currently have a team upwards of 25 people um, that, that manage cyber across the province. It's not just for health. Um, so it's not just us. Uh, we will need some internal folks. Uh, and I'm, you know, uh, I, I'm going to guess somewhere between three and five people. Um, based on, on the preliminary report, um, but they'll be working very closely with uh, that team with Nova Scotia Digital. But Dr. those numbers are yet to be finalized or confirmed. 
I apologize, Dr. Kerr. Uh, thank you, and I, I, yeah, I apologize. Uh, but I, I think what's most important here is um, cybersecurity and privacy is everybody's job in, in, in Nova Scotia Health. <laughs> and so all 40,000 of those people need to understand if they're interacting with you know, patients or in any way supporting patient care, that they have a duty and a responsibility to be part of that team. And so that's job number one, is, is, is creating the culture in our organization where everybody understands the role that they play. And, so that, and that's our goal. They, we will be supported by our communications teams, by, by content experts within the ITIM portfolio. We will work with our partners. Uh, we will be guided by kind of the, you know, emerging kind of understanding of how best to manage this in our environment. But at the end of the day, we are only going to be successful when every person who comes to work who's interacting with patient information understands that they have an individual role. Because as Mr. Nemirovsky said, the greatest form of threat is somebody sending an email, which you know happens virtually every day to all of us, where somebody is trying to get us to do something that would, you know, that could compromise patients. And so we have it's not just a flippant statement. We have to have everybody kind of playing on the team. Mr. Jessup. Yes, and uh, you know, as a non-cybersecurity uh, expert myself, I, I wouldn't um, preconceive what the size of a team should be to, to manage this, and certainly everybody plays a role. Um, I would also uh, highlight again for the record that um, you know there there was an agreement that there uh, expressed agreement here today that there was a gap between where responsibilities for certain things fit in, and then a, a, a charted path forward uh, toward trying to button those up, identify where those gaps were and who was responsible for what. So it sounds like there's a strong consciousness to, to get beyond that and, and continue to improve. Um, uh, lost my spot here, excuse me. Uh, so, in upon the amalgamation of our our health authorities, are there things that uh, respective uh, uh, health authorities were doing that uh, we've brought with us to the overarching uh, structure? Are there things that have changed? And I, I guess um, what reassurances that can you provide uh, the committee to say that uh, you know we're taking the good and 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 shaving off the the not so efficient stuff that's been that's been taking a place with respect to um, enhancement of cyber cyber security and protection of privacy through the chair, Mr. Norovsky. So, uh, as with pretty much every other part of the um, amalgamation of NSHA, we, we've done exactly what we've talked about, taken, taken the good, tried to get rid of the bad practices, uh, and, and keep those things that were effective, and um, keeping patient data safe, um, keeping our systems secure. Um, it, it's still a learning process for everyone. Um, as the cybersecurity landscape changes on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, um, it's very hard to keep up with the criminals. Uh, they're really smart and they have lots of resources. So we, we work as hard as we can, but it's, uh, it's an ongoing challenge. And it is not just for health, it is for every organization around the world. So it's, it's not just a NSHA problem, it's a government problem, it's a public problem, it's a you know, Amazon problem. Um, they're just, there's money to be made, uh, and so they, they, they put the effort in to try and beat us. Thank you. The time for the Liberal Caucus has expired. So that uh, concludes the questioning, and we'll open the floor up now to the witnesses, Dr. Kerr or any of your team, if you'd like to make some closing comments. I'll just make a very brief comment. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for your questions. Um, uh, I would also um, like to uh, uh, thank uh, the Auditor General uh, for the work that they do and the important role that they play uh, uh, as uh, an, an independent body that kind of takes a hard look at the work that we do and, and offers a critical appraisal. And uh, we, I hope uh, that you will appreciate that we take that very seriously. We take the accountability that we have as an organization extremely seriously and, and uh, 
we do endeavor every day to make sure that uh, the resources that are entrusted to us are being used, uh, that they're being used appropriately, that they're delivering the most value that we can for the citizens of Nova Scotia. Uh, I, it, this is the first opportunity that I've had to come to public accounts in Nova Scotia, so I would also just like to say thank you for that today. Uh, and perhaps on another time, uh, we'll have the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit more about our health system, not so much about COVID, but just generally speaking. But uh, suffice it to say, um, you know, the, the citizens of Nova Scotia should be very proud of the health system in Nova Scotia. Uh, as a rule of thumb, we spend uh, on average or a little bit less than average of our peers across the country, and our performance is generally uh, average to above average. Uh, there are certainly areas that we need to improve, but as a, as a system overall, we do a very good job. Uh, and I think the, the last comment that I'll make as, a, as, a, as somebody coming back into this organization, seeing an organization that's been through a significant change in the last five years, we, we should all take some comfort in this organization's ability to respond through COVID and do that in a way that has been joined up, that has demonstrated, I think, the, the intention of creating a, a, a single system. Uh, and we should take a lot of comfort in the fact that when, as a province, when we've identified particular areas of need, like mental health and addictions, attaching people to primary care teams, if you actually look at the data on how Nova Scotia has been performing vis-a-vis -vis other provinces, we're actually leading most other provinces are doing better than average. So that, that is a signal that not that we've got everything right, but that, that the system that we're creating is actually allowing us to take to focus on important things and get those important things done. I would look forward, forward in the future to talking to you more about what some of those important things are, like health equity, about diversity, about how we deal with systemic bias in our system, and many of the th kinds of things that, that are impacting healthcare in our province. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes the uh, questioning of the witnesses on today's topic. Uh, we'll give the uh, witnesses an opportunity if they want to gather up everything. Again, we thank you on behalf of the Public Accounts Committee for appearing here today. And COVID did throw a couple of wrenches in because we, we had a plan to meet earlier, but that couldn't happen. So again, thank you very much. Okay, we'll uh, move on to uh, committee business. Uh, Mr. Hammond. With your permission, I'd like to put forward a motion. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Chair, on September 28, 2018, uh, this, com this committee embarked on an experiment that was forced upon it by the Liberal Caucus. The Liberal Caucus's resolution on September 28, 2018 stated that all agenda items for public accounts be set through the Auditor General. This narrowed the scope of the committee and decreased the effectiveness and relevance of the committee. Together with the decrease in the number of meetings, these changes have not served Nova Scotians well, nor have they served our system well. At this time, Nova Scotians expect more accountability and transparency from those who represent them, not less. They expect standing committees to deal with issues that impact their lives, not only issues that the Auditor General has examined, but also topics outside of that report. So therefore, Mr. Chair, I move that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts returns to weekly meetings, and that in addition to reports of the Auditor General, committee meetings examine topics brought forward by all three caucuses and agreed to by the subcommittee and entire committee. Okay, you've heard the motion. I need discussion. Ms. Ms. Roberts, sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I would be in support of this motion. Um, as members of the Public Accounts Committee, uh, we had the opportunity to attend um, some online training with uh, the chair of the Public Accounts Committee in England in September. And that training focused on uh, that committee's role in oversight um, and accountability for um, Britain, the UK's uh, COVID response. And, and that included a whole litany of, of activities and meetings um, 
uh, that, that really showed the potential of a public accounts committee and, and you know, despite all the various challenges that uh, democracy has faced in the UK, um, the, the public accounts committee in the UK is held up as sort of, you know, the exemplar of uh, a good um, public accounts committee a functioning uh, one. Um, and, and, you know, it was just striking during that same period of time when they had had that whole, um, that very robust program of, um, of work, our committee had not met um, until literally uh, one day before that training when we had a first meeting. And, and as much as I welcomed the conversation today and the opportunity to, you know, find out what's happened since October 2019, frankly, uh, given all that has happened, uh, we ought to be we ought to be in a position to be uh, putting forward new topics and being responsive uh, to uh, what best serves the interest of Nova Scotians to learn more about. And that includes both uh, topics that are being examined by the Auditor General, but also other topics that relate uh, to the, the the finances and and administration of uh, of public resources by the government of Nova Scotia. Any further discussion? Mr. Hammond. I'd like to thank uh, my colleague for uh, her, her, her remarks. It's very important. And I'd like to call for a recorded vote, Mr. Chair. A recorded vote has been called for. So everybody understands the motion that uh, public accounts will change the weekly meetings on topics that are chosen uh, and submitted to the subcommittee by each caucus. Am I correct with that, Mr. Hammond? Okay, and the recorded vote. I'll uh, keep a, a standing record here now. <laughs> uh, Ms. Roberts. Yes. Mr. Hallman. Yes. Ms. Lonis Croft. No. Ms. Miller. No. Mr. Jessup. No. Ms. De Costanzo. No. Mr. Horn. No. Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. And as chair, I will vote yes. So the motion has been defeated, five to four. Okay. So we'll move on now to uh, other committee business. Uh, the first is, uh, you recall from our last meeting, there was a discussion on requesting updates for the implementations of uh, various recommendations of the Auditor General. And then we, we did send those letters out and we got responses from the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development relating to the November 2016 Auditor General Report. And from Department of Health and Wellness uh, on the June 2015 General Report. And from Service Nova Scotia, a uh, response from the June 15, 2000 or I'm sorry, June 2015 report as well. So that is received for your information. Okay, the next uh, meeting is scheduled to happen on November 11th, which is Remembrance Day. So we need to pick uh, an alternate date for that meeting and uh, I'd like to suggest either the 4th or the 18th and the committee can decide. Discussion? Ms. Roberts? Um, I would like to suggest uh, the fourth, um, and perhaps we'll create some potential for an additional meeting in November. Thank you. Mr. Hobb. Yeah, I'm fine with November 4th. Any further discussion? So it, uh, do we agree that the next meeting will be on November 4th? Agreed? Thank you. Also, the... Uh, 2019 annual report has been circulated to everyone. Uh, there's been no comments or changes received from the members. So we could have a motion to approve the 2019 annual report of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Mr. Jessen. All those in favor? Contrary minded? Motion is carried. 
Next on the agenda is the Subcommittee on Agenda and Procedures from our September 9th uh, meeting. We met on September 9th to review the three reports of the Auditor General, namely the uh, June 2020 report regarding the Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation Phase 1, uh, the July 14th, 2020 report regarding the QE2 New Generation Project, the Halifax Infirmary Expansion and Community Outpatient Center Phase 2, and on July 28th, the 2020 report regarding government-wide contaminated sites. So the decision from, the, from that meeting has been provided to the members. So I'm going to ask for a motion to approve uh, that record of decision. Do we have a mover? Mr. LeBlanc, okay. All those in favor? Aye. Counter by this. Motion is carried. So our next meeting date is going to be uh, November 4th, as we agreed. And I don't know what, do we have a meeting set up yet? No. So well, probably one of those three will be on the agenda, hopefully for the November 4th meeting. Uh, is there any further business to come before us today? None? Again, just a reminder before we leave, out the side exits, and there's recycle bins out there next to the exits if you want to get rid of your water bottles, papers, and everything else. So if there's no further business, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you.